Sing the symphony My heart beats when it could not sing a P One G, play some keys to sing for me I get hooked to the chorus guaranteed uh, I'm a tempo tempo Music takes you to the place it came from Instrumentals in your mental echoes In your subconscious it hits and set those Catch Amazing Minds Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, 20 hours Central African time on YouTube, Google, Apple and Spotify for podcasters. Zambia's first late night show. All right, you're welcome to Bible Talks. I hope you brought your shouting clothes tonight. Uh, glad to be back here. Haven't been here in the past two weeks due to circumstances beyond our control, but we're glad to be back here. I hope you've been following the Personality of God series that we've been doing the past couple of weeks. Hopefully today will be the last segment of that series. Uh, let's see how it goes. Maybe we'll be able to complete uh, what we have prepared. If not, then it definitely won't be the last. We'll have a part six. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe. Hit that bell and share. Uh, we have a Monday show, which is available every Monday, 20 hours Central African time. That is the political segment of the show. We have the Wednesday show, which is available every Wednesday. Uh, still have uh, a few things to put in place for the Wednesday show. It's been under construction. We've been pre-shooting a couple of episodes to try to mitigate the current power situation we have in Zambia. I always jokingly say that in Zambia, it's as if we have been given a foretaste of the tribulation <laughs> the time of trouble. Yes, and Bible Talks is every Friday, 20 hours Central African time. So please do subscribe, hit that bell and share, comment, share, tell your loved ones to tell their loved ones that Bible Talks is here and tell them to bring their shouting clothes as they come. Yeah, so we've been discussing the personality of God series, as I mentioned earlier, and today is the fifth part. The last, the fourth part was God is light. And today we're doing a part two of God is light, as I promised, that would continue with the subject of God being light. So a quick recap on where we began with this personality of God series, it's important. The Bible says deep calleth unto deep. The Bible also says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out because God is in the business of hiding matters about himself, about his dwelling place, about his ways of doing things. Um, yet he desires for us to seek those things out uh, as a way of us pursuing him and showing our interest in him. God is really interested in our free will pursuits. Uh, if you're giving something to God, then he's interested in you giving it out of your own free will because God wants our hearts. God is after our hearts. 
And therefore, he's intrigued by those men that tend to be after his heart like David or like Bahatram. So uh, we started by talking about how God is the source in part one. God is the source from where we all came from, all things came from. Every planet, every galaxy, every form of matter, every spirit, every single thing came out of God. And that's a subject that I would like us to later on get deeper into. Uh, once the channel does grow, of course, we're going to get into deeper subjects to discuss how exactly these things came out of God. But we simplified it. I talked about how God has three stages of, uh, or rather how things uh, come out from God in three stages. They begin in his thoughts, then they are transported by his words into a realm where they can be seen. We also discussed how that God is unseen. He is the invisible God. He has not been seen. He cannot be seen. But blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. So do leave your comments on which part of this series has left you with questions. I believe that revelation should really mean just that, revelation. It should be revealed, a mystery revealed. If a mystery remains a mystery, then it's no longer a revelation. Therefore, I do not want you to leave this place, this series, uh, feeling confused, still having questions. It would mean that I have not explained comprehensively. We went on to then discuss God being strong, describing the magnitude of the God we worship. You know, Jesus said something interesting to the woman at the well. He had a conversation with her about, about water. He asked her to give, to give him a cup of water. And she said, you Jews say, I'm paraphrasing, you Jews say uh, where to worship is in the temple and we say where to worship is in the mountains. And Jesus said, a time is coming and now is. Everyone shall worship God in spirit and in truth for the Father seeketh, seeketh such to worship him, right? But the interesting part I would like to focus on is where he said, you do not, you worship what you do not know. You do not know what you worship. You worship what you do not know. Unfortunately, that's the case with many Christians today. Yes, they have accepted Jesus Christ, a figurative Christ, whom they've never heard or seen. They worship a figurative Christ who provides them with figurative solutions. There is no reality to the relationship they have with Christ. And therefore, God himself cannot fully be revealed, cannot be revealed to them because Christ is the way. He's the truth. He's the revelation of God. And unless you have a revelation of Christ, you cannot have a revelation of God. And so we discussed how God is strong, trying to explain the magnitude of the God we worship for you to have a deeper understanding. How far does his rule extend? He is God to who? And we described all that. We talked about how he created the worlds and how there are races of different beings in different worlds. We talked about the different heavens that are there. Uh, and we talked about him dwelling in the ultimate heaven, which we'll discuss uh, a bit deeper today. So today we're discussing, or oh, we further went on actually to discuss God is light. We talked about how God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Uh, and how that God's light, God being light, is because he is the information by which all of creation operates. And we further talked about how God divided the darkness from the light and called the light day and the darkness night, which was the division of two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And at this point, the kingdom of darkness was officially left out of the knowledge of God. So all that the kingdom of darkness is working with is old knowledge when they once dwelt in the light of God. But now everything else is darkness to them. And we talked about how the church has been brought up to reveal the mysteries that have been hidden for all these ages, ever since the establishment of the kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness, that division, there have been mysteries. Mysteries, for example, the triune nature of God is revealed in the church because even Satan himself did not understand. How are you the son of God? 
you know, in reference to Christ. This is why he tempted him and he took him to all manner of places, uh, tempting him. Yes, and so now today we are going to discuss God is light, part two. We're going to focus more on Christ today as we aim to conclude this series, which I hope we sincerely, I sincerely hope we will rather. I sincerely hope we'll be able to conclude this series today. I remember leaving you with a scripture last week um, that described Christ as the light. And I told you I would distinguish God being light from Christ being the light. Uh, when I was in school, in university, we learned, I believe in my first year of my undergrad degree, we learned about definite articles and indefinite articles, which seemed a bit irrelevant at the time. But obviously, we <laughs> almost never accept knowledge when it comes immediately. We are very seriously into the habit of allowing knowledge to marinate first within us before we accept it. So we hear something, we don't accept it there and then. We allow it to first mature in us. And sometimes in doing that, we delay what that knowledge was supposed to unlock. Remember Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, knowledge of the truth, and the truth that you know shall make you free. So even if the sun has set you free and you're free indeed, it is the knowledge of the truth that shall make you free. Because there's a difference between being set free and being made free. There are some people that would be set free. They're in a prison cell, they're told you're free to go. Uh, the door is open, but they do not know that they are free to go. So they stay in the prison cell with an open door. Uh, and it's only when someone comes in to pull them out of the cell that they are made free. And this is what the knowledge of the truth does to us. It makes, it makes us free. John chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now, when we study the... Uh, creation account, God creates the heavens and the earth, and then further goes on to make man in his image according to his likeness. God makes Adam and breathes the breath of life into his nostrils, and man becomes a living soul. At this point, God has distributed his light into Adam by form in form of a spirit. The spirit man has indwelt the body. The spirit carries all the knowledge of God and is amalgamating into the body, into the soul. You see, the spirit knows. Your spirit knows because it came from God, but your soul is longing to know. You are on this journey of life to educate your soul. Everything that you begin to learn, whether in school, whether through interactions, whether by going to places, all this knowledge you could find within your spirit if you knew how to get inside. But this soul is what is then picking up knowledge that it can't access inside of its spirit because your spirit came from God. It came with all the knowledge, but your soul has to learn. So your spirit knows, but your soul longs to know. And the spirit is what carries the light of God. Now, what happened is after Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the light of God. They began to live in darkness, which means God became a mystery at that point. Just as God is a mystery to Satan and to the demons, God became a mystery to Adam, to Eve, to humanity. And God has been trying to reveal himself and to restore this light to Adam. So what God then did was to send the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And the account I just read to you, John chapter 1, verse 8 to 9, is talking about John the Baptist, who was a voice crying out. Uh, he was not that light, but he came to bear witness of that light, the true light, the light that gives light 
to every man coming into the world. That's Jesus Christ, the second Adam. No wonder he is described. The Bible says the first Adam was made a living soul and the second Adam has been made a life-giving spirit. This is because every man that is coming into the world, it is Christ who gives them light, who restores that operating system, that knowledge of God, your ability to be able to know God. You know, someone asked me a question uh, last week about Satan. And why does Satan not understand Bible prophecy? Like, why is his plan still in course? He is still going for the same plan, even though he knows how it will end. How is he still behaving quite ignorant? And I say to him, your ability to understand the scriptures is a privilege. It's the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, the scriptures are unrecognizable to you. They are words, they are stories. No wonder we have human beings today who do not believe in the validity of the word of God. They think the word of God is a joke. Why? Because it is not by human ability. Remember what Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, ah, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. He knew, he understood that there's knowledge about God that does not just come from flesh and blood. It needs to have been spiritually revealed unto you. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. So God is light and Jesus Christ came to restore this light. He came to give back the light that Adam lost the spirit man, to restore light into the spirit man, that the spirit man may get to know God again. And our responsibility now is to bring our souls and our bodies into conformity with the knowledge that our spirits now carry. So Christ is described as the light, a definite article, I was telling you about definite and indefinite articles. Definite articles are those that describe a specific thing while indefinite articles simply describe a type. So if I say to you, I saw a car, it could be any car. I could have seen a Jeep, I could have seen a Toyota, I could have seen a Mazda. But if I say to you, I saw the car, then you would know specifically what car I'm talking about because I've used the definite article, the. Whereas if I use a car, that would be an indefinite article. So Christ, for example, did not say, I am a way, a truth, and a life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus Christ is a definite article. And this is the same thing when we talk about light. The Bible does not say God is the light, right? God is light. God is light. What means is there may be all manner of lights, all manner of lights that you may see of all manner of shapes, sizes, and colors, but there is a source, God. God is light. No wonder the Bible further goes on in the book of James to call him the father of lights. God is light. So regardless of what light you may think of, it all initially came from God. No wonder he's called the father of lights. But then when it refers to Christ, it says the light. The reason why Christ is the light is because of all the lights that may be there, he is the only restoring light. He's the only light that lights up every other man. If this world needs to be lit up, we need Christ. But if this world has lights within it, then those lights came from God, but those lights cannot lead us up. Do you get the distinction there? So Christ is the light. There's a definite article there. Christ is the light. No wonder he himself says, I am the light of the world. So Christ is the light. Now to further understand why Christ himself is the only way through which we can be lit up back, reconciled back to God. I'll read you a scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter one, uh, from verse one to four. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, 
has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, taking out of the word worlds, it's plural, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Wow, this scripture is so rich. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 is extremely rich. I wish I could explain to you everything that's being talked about here. But we'll narrow in on Christ being the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person. Uh, going back to Adam and and Eve, going back to Adam, when God made Adam, he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So Adam's image is a reflection of God's likeness, his person. The body is a reflection of the person. So the body is not the person, but the reflection of the person. Now, in our world today and our age today, when we talk about someone's body, we now have statements like, my body, my choice. But initially, when God made us, it was not my body, my choice. It was that the body that Adam had was a reflection of God's person. So God's likeness was reflected in Adam's body because God is invisible. He needed to be seen through Adam on earth. But when Adam lost that godly nature, the light, what happened is Adam became a reflection of his own person. But what Christ then, being the second Adam, the last Adam came to do, was to bring back, to restore man's image into the likeness of God. So Christ himself is the fullness of the expression of God's person. He is the first copy, the word express there, the first copy of the person of God. That's why when Philip asked, show us the father. He said, how long shall I be with you that you do not know me yet? When you see me, you have seen the father. So Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person. The first copy of what God looks like. In short, when you look at God and you look at Christ, you are not able to distinguish. He is the brightness of God's glory. The word glory talks about weight. It talks about prestige, majesty, all that God means. God's glory is what God means, the weight of who he is. In, in economics, there's a principle called purchase power parity. You may be watching this from anywhere in the world. I'm in Zambia. This studio does not have uh, the flag. Our other studio on the Monday show has has a flag, the Zambian flag, behind me. We have a principle in economics that we call purchase power parity, where in Zambia we use kwacha. I don't have any with me now. I'll have shown you what it looks like. But what the kwacha is able to purchase here is not the same as what is it's able to purchase in the United States. What one dollar can purchase in the United States is not the same as what it would purchase in Zambia. So the purchase, the power, the purchase power is the weight of that dollar bill or that quarter bill. If you have a ten dollars, what it's able to buy is the weight of the dollar, is what the dollar means. So a ten dollar is only worth what it's able to buy. When we say the glory of God, we are describing the worth of God, what God means. So when the Bible says he is the brightness of God's glory, we're talking about the visual aspects of what God means. What it truly means to be God is physically represented in Christ. No wonder when you read it from the Amplified Version, uh, the, the book of Philippians talks about how he thought it not robbery to equate himself to God, though possessing the very qualities that make God God. So Christ 
is the brightness of God's glory and the first copy of his person. Therefore, when we talk about God being light, the source, God distributed himself across all creation. But when we talk about the light, we're talking about God taking up a form in form of a person and beginning to distribute light through this person. You need to understand the extent that God is actually inside Christ, that Christ is God's dwelling place, that God the Father and the Holy Spirit are found within Christ. The fullness of God the Father's expression, the fullness of God the Spirit's expression can be found in Christ. Take note of what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. What? No one comes to the Father. He didn't say no one goes to the Father as though the Father was somewhere else. No one comes to the Father <laughs> except through me. When Moses entered the cloud, remember that the Lord stopped him and said, ensure that they do not proceed, those that are below the mountain, lest the Lord break forth on them. And he told Moses to trade carefully, lest the Lord break forth on him. So the Lord talking to Moses, warning him about the Lord. You see, every time Moses entered the cloud, he encountered the first copy of God. Christ. And to understand this a bit deeper, we need to get into the development of what we know to be Christ, how Christ transitioned from being the Word to becoming the Son, to becoming flesh. We need to understand that. We need to understand what Christ, what stages Christ went through in order for that to be achieved. You see, the development of anything, whether it's a baby, the baby does not just come out as a baby. There were stages. There was a form that the baby was before, and then the baby became a, a zygote. And, you know, there are all those stages. I don't fully remember what the stages are. But then finally, you have a baby. Whether it's a seed that you plant into the ground, it takes up different forms before it later on becomes a tree. Regardless of what it is, it all takes up different forms before it becomes. The word become signifies a process. So the word became flesh is a process. And you can see that even the word becoming flesh in Jesus' case took a couple of months. It was, in, it was through pregnancy. So there were different developmental stages happening there. But prior to that, what were the developmental stages for Christ to have then been inserted into a womb, the word to have been inserted into a womb and come out as a person? There were stages of development. The Bible in the book of Hebrews talks about how he emptied himself. So the word of God came out of God, the first copy of God, and then begins to defragment, to reduce in size, to empty himself of virtue, of power. No wonder by the time he came to the earth as a human being, he said, the father is greater than I. So Christ bears within his body God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, verse 9 to 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Oh, I wish I had time. I would like to explain verse 10. The head of all principality and power. <laughs> this also is developmental. This has a lot to do with what I just told you about the developmental stages of the word becoming flesh. But we're not going to get into that today. Verse 9 talks about, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I believe I've explained that to you. In Christ is God. God dwells in Christ. Now, the importance of Christ cannot be overemphasized after this. I think I have tried my best to explain to you how 
It is only through Christ that we have access into God's light. Without Christ, we cannot access the knowledge of God. God becomes a mystery forever. Our own source becomes a mystery forever. Imagine one day waking up, you're in a road accident. You wake up, you're in hospital. You've lost your memory. You don't recognize anyone. But then your life begins afresh. And you never get to meet the people that you once knew to be your family. I think that would be devastating. I know some people might think that's a nice thing because they may be going through some difficult phases of life. But don't forget, it's a phase. Whatever you're going through, remember it's not your destination. You're going through. I want to read you a final scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. This scripture is talking about God, who alone has immortality. You see, nothing can live forever except God makes it live forever, because only he has immortality. But the interesting statement right after that is that he dwells in unapproachable light. Who dwells in unapproachable light? Now, I'll try to quickly explain to you just what this means very quickly in winding up. Remember, we discussed how God made the earth and the heavens, and we talked about how when Christ died, he went down into the lower parts of the earth, into hell, and then he ascended and gave gifts to men. But then he ascended above all heavens. Remember when he presented, when he appeared to Mary after having been raised from the dead, he said, don't touch me for I have not presented myself to the Father. Right? Because at that time, Mary wasn't clean. Now, Jesus Christ then goes on to present himself to the Father and goes above all heavens. And along the way, he carries with him captives. The Bible says he led captivity captive. The Bible also says that when he died and rose from the dead, many graves were opened and many saints of old appeared in the city. So we know that when Jesus ascended, he ascended with them. I'm explaining this to get you to understand that the way God laid out creation is that he created earth, there are worlds beneath the earth, but there are worlds above the earth that we know as heavens. Heaven is also simply referring to a world above a world. Um, when we talk about the world of birds, birds fly in the heavens, they're the birds of the heavens. But we can see them. They even rest on the earth sometimes. But they are the birds of the heavens, right? They're the birds of heaven, rather. Now, the reason why we are not able to go and fly with the birds in heaven is because there's a force on our earth that keeps us down, and we have given it a name. Uh, in our modern day and age, we call it gravity. This gravity does not enable us to live in any world above our own. So even if we went to be with the birds, we have to create technology that enables us to be there for a while. It would take a lot of money to be able to sustain ourselves up there. But even the birds themselves cannot go beyond a certain point. Beyond that point, they wouldn't survive. They are forces which keep them in their heaven. And when you go above and find the beings that dwell above the heaven of the birds, you are going to find forces that do not allow them to proceed. Now, you also agree with me if you're into science. I, I watch a lot of these space documentaries and movies every now and then. You agree with me that the higher you go, the more hostile it becomes for your body. You could actually die by going too high. Even if a plane goes too high, it needs a proper ventilation system. 
right? Because you can't survive certain altitudes. There's pressure as you go. What many people don't understand, the misconception many people have, is that there's no place hotter than hell or hotter than the lake of fire. I'll ask you this, where did the fire come from? The fire that makes the lake of fire, where is it coming from? The fire that you believe is in hell, where is it coming from? I'll ask you this question also. Where did the fire come from that rained down when Elijah prayed? It rained down on the altar. The misconception many people have is that hell is the hottest place, that hell is the most hostile environment for a human body. Actually, the human body cannot survive heaven. That's why Jesus has to just make new bodies. He just needs to do an overhaul, make new bodies to be able to accommodate us in heaven for a while. We're being accommodated in heaven for a while. But we need new bodies. Well, of course, there's so much more to those new bodies. But imagine we're being accommodated in heaven for a while, and we need new bodies for that. So you need to understand that the higher you go, the more hostile it becomes. The higher the heaven, the more hostile it becomes. Because heaven is actually the hottest place you can think of. It's the brightest place you can think of. The Bible calls it unapproachable light. So now, I'm explaining this to you because I'm trying to highlight the importance of Christ and what it means when you believe in Christ and you begin to grow in the knowledge. The Bible says, The entrance of thy word giveth light and understanding to the simple. You see that? Light is tied to understanding. The entrance of thy words giveth light and understanding to the simple. This is because the light that you accumulate today in your walk with God after Christ has lit you up is not only necessary for this world. I think I read you a scripture in our earlier Bible talks talking about if our hope in Christ is in this life only, we are the most miserable of all men. Because our hope in Christ extends into the world beyond this world. Death is not the end. It's the beginning of a permanent life. But the amount of light you accumulated in this life helps you ascend into heaven. If you have not, you have to go and wait somewhere to be instructed on the knowledge of God that your light can increase before you can go, because you will not be able to withstand the environment of God. The Bible talks about how Lucifer had such proximity to God that he walked upon the fiery coals. You talk about heaven, the ultimate heaven of heavens. You're talking about a place filled with fire. Before the throne of God, there are coals. The Bible says when God is angry, what comes out of his nostrils? Fire. You need to understand, the Bible says God is a consuming fire. The prophets that had encounters with him, when Ezekiel saw him, he said it was like a whirlwind, a mixture of fire and light. So Christ is the access into an approachable light. But the knowledge that we begin to grow into. After Christ has lit us up, we are now able to understand the word. We are now able to understand God if we pursue him. What happens then is we begin to increase in light. We begin to increase. We become heavenly beings. We are able to get into heaven freely if we overcome this physical habitation. The day you leave earth, you die, your physical habitation has been overcome, your spirit man, needs to be bright enough to ascend, needs to have accumulated light to ascend. And this is why the knowledge that we're sharing, that I'm sharing here with you today is very important, very cardinal. God is light. Christ is the light. Heaven is an approachable light. Therefore, 
the word of God is what builds you, prepares you for the life ahead of the life we have today. Oh, isn't God good? He always makes a way. The intention was never for us to go to heaven. The intention was for us to be here. And even after we go to heaven, we are coming back here. But now that we have to go to heaven, let us accumulate light, ladies and gentlemen. Adam did not complete his process of mentorship with the Lord when the Lord was building his spirit man, building his soul in light. He did not complete the process, but we can complete the process because we have the Holy Ghost who proceeds from the Father. I hope you've been blessed by this series, The Personality of God. I hope it sparks a hunger in you to want to learn more about God. I wish I can tell you more about what exactly happens when people die. Uh, show you from the scriptures. This, the scriptures are replete with explanations. The scriptures are replete with explanations of what happens to the human spirit, the human soul when a person dies. But we shall go into that um, a bit later. Once again, I appeal to you, please do subscribe, hit that bell and share. There's so much for you to learn here, so much for you to uh, have access to in terms of knowledge. <sighs> see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.